Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Health Via Modern Nutrition HVMN Podcast. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. And I'm super excited to have this conversation with my friend, Robbie Bent. So we recently connected over a lot of mutual interests with self-experimentation, biohacking, flow states, meditation, self-exploration. And we actually had a first version of this conversation which will be lost in the ether because of technical difficulties. But uh, excited to do this better and, and, and bigger than ever. So Robbie, welcome on the program. I'm excited to have this conversation. Thanks, Jeff. Super stoked, man. Uh, I really, really uh, dig what you're doing. Likewise, I think maybe the w- way to start here is just touching base on the self-experimentation, self-exploration. I think you've had just this boldness, this bravery to just kind of do these extreme stunts for folks that might not, you know, be you know, aware of different ways you can challenge yourself. Maybe just start from, from that level. You've done, you know, dark retreats, you know, living essentially in a cave. You've done silent retreats. You've done a number of extreme challenges. What instigated this journey? Yeah, I think uh, around 28, I had a pretty big moment of transformation when my first, you know, BC back startup failed, lost everything, and at the same time was dealing with substance abuse issues. And I kind of wanted to change. And I had been listening to a lot of Tim Ferriss stuff and kind of got in my head this idea, you know, I had a lot of fears growing up, fear of like rejection, fear of failure, fear of the dark, things that like really dominated my mind when I was young, really concerned about, you know, what people would think of me and getting validation. And so I had this idea like, oh, if I could conquer my fears, if I could face them, it would create strength. And so I got really obsessed with like, okay, what are hard things I can do. And I'd been meditating for uh, a while and I just heard about the Vipassana retreat. And so this was sort of the first step into this world. And I was living in Israel, working on my, my second business, a hardware company out there. And during the holidays, I didn't have the money to come home. And I thought, oh, it might be better over the Christmas break. I'll just do this 10 day meditation retreat. And I met someone at a bar and he just said, oh, you know, you don't really meditate if you haven't tried a Vipassana or this was kind of like the best way to start. And so I just thought like, hey, I'm looking for for change in my life. I want to test myself. Uh, and that sort of started an entire journey, which we can get into, into, you know, psychedelic medicines. And then through both of those, mastered the substance abuse issue and found myself very able to like sit with discomfort from those practices and then very able to reset the nervous system and like become aware of, of challenging thoughts, right? And so, so we, can get in, we can get into both, both of those. And I really like how you started from a place of despair or the sense of failure. And I think this is a state that most people in our modern society don't really talk about or, or shy away from, or they never even put themselves in a spot to even fail because they tap out of challenging themselves in the first place, right? Because I think there is a sense of not wanting to be embarrassed and staying in the comfort zone. And I think just through my entrepreneurial career and challenging myself, I found that the only learning comes from seeing despair, seeing a potential death, whether that's a business death or an ego death. That's when you truly learn because if you never see the foil of success, like how do you even define success? How do you even define happiness? if we don't understand what it means to be uh, the kind of a lack thereof, right? It may be a way to make it less abstract. I think I sense this in a couple of different ways. One, through just doing intermittent fasting, fasting for, you know, 16, eight, a very mild fast, like a, like a shorter eating window, upwards of a seven day water fast for, in that experience I felt was very spiritual, very uh, enlightening in terms of self-awareness of just truly understanding what, hunger like physiological hunger was versus hey i'm bored my belly wants some like stimulus and i want to just have some serotonin and dopamine release it triggered for my belly having something to process and realizing what true hunger was was very very useful because now when i'm normally out and about in the day i can reflect to that experience and realize oh that's what hunger really is and i can be much more nuanced in interpreting my feelings of hey 
am I actually hungry? Or am I just bored? And can I channel that boredom into something more productive? Or hey, maybe I'm willing to have a snack anyways, right? So I think what you're talking about in terms of like triggering this path going down self exploration, it sounds like this startup experience led you down this path of you know meditation and self challenge. So yeah, I mean, I think can we can we talk and and, and start about the those traumatic experiences i mean i think it'd be build it would be very valuable to build up that context and build up build up that 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 the, the broader story before diving into some of the exploration yeah definitely and and to your point you know the fasting seven days is no joke so like awesome awesome job and and what these things do i mean at first i was like oh, i want to be brave i want to conquer my fears if i can do this i'll be strong and when bad things happen i'll be prepared so you know after that first failure it's like you mentioned people don't do things where they can fail. And a lot of times the fear of failure is much more significant than the failure itself. And so when this business, the two years I was worried about failing were terrible. And when the failure happened, it was like, oh, okay, I can figure out something else I'm passionate about. And like within two weeks, I had you know new opportunities. And so the failure itself actually wasn't the issue, which is really interesting. And then, you know, I thought, well, if I can get stronger and go through these challenging experiences, then like things won't hurt me because I that hurt was like very challenging. And when I did those experiences, that wasn't actually what happened. It was very much like, wow, there's value in changing your state. And so an example is, okay, if I, if I do a job that's very stable where I, you know, grow incrementally each year, small promotion, small promotion, and, you know, I start at 25 and at 40, I'll, I'll hit my dream and retire at 60. You know, you're, you're never, if you're in that state, you don't, when you don't fail, you don't question. You're always like, okay, I just need to get that next promotion. I need to get that next promotion. And then it turns out, you know, at 40 or 60, when you retire, you're like, well, this isn't what I wanted anyways. I'm not, I'm not happy. Right. And so when you push through what I found is you want to be changing your emotional state as much as possible to make sure the way you're thinking is actually correct. And, and what I mean by that is it's very easy to get into a hole, especially when you're busy on, on your business. If you're an entrepreneur and you're listening, it's like, you're just at the task level. You know, I have these 10 things to do today. I got to get them done. And next thing you know, like three months or six months goes by. And so when you can do something like a Vipassana retreat, simple meditation at home, a float, maybe exercise some way to clear your mind. And the longer, the more days you spend doing this, the more intense you experience, the more your mind will, will clear, you'll get present. You start to realize like, okay, do am I on the right path? Do I want to do this? And if you don't take the time to do that, to sort of stop the standard thought patterns, I think you can get stuck. And that was kind of a lot of the power I found like a seven day fast, like you said, like, okay, how does my hunger work? How am I feeling? Emotions come up. It's like really beautiful to allow yourself to stop. 100%. I, I mean, I just, just, just to bounce and riff off of that. I think what you're talking about in terms of just, you know, I remember in college looking at, you know, managing directors at investment banks and being like, oh, they seem really successful in terms of title and, and compensation. But I think I, for whatever reason, just realized quite young, like just even in, in college days, looking at them and being like, hey, they don't seem particularly healthy or wise or interesting. Do I really want to spend the next 20 years that end up being in that job, being some partner at some consulting firm? They don't even seem that cool. And so I never got on that track. And I don't know what it was in terms of like that realization or that snobbery. Maybe I was arrogant and conceited, or there was just some sense of stronger self identity of wanting to be a little bit more of an adventurer or explorer. But I feel like most people I talk to, and this is not judgmental, I think we're all in our own journeys, kind of go into default road paths where it's like you go through school, you go, you, you, you accomplish what you, you, you focus on standardized tests, classes, go to a good college you choose a major, and then you kind of go on a default decision tree, right? If you go down the pre-med route, you're going to go to be a doctor, then you're going to choose your specialty, whether it's emergency or ophthalmology or heart or surgery. And then you're just automatically moving forward, right? If you go in, in finance, you go to be an investment banker, then you go be go on the private equity side, you go be a hedge fund analyst, you go to business school, and then you, you, you continue down that, that, that standard route. And people very rarely as you said, step back and have a 
time to just actually think and process like what is happening, how they're allocating their like very limited time. And it sounds like whether that's early self-awareness or a failure that like forces you to pause, I think that's where I think these like hard shaking moments are very, very valuable. Because again, I think in our world, we're, I think we ego defend so much because no one wants to be embarrassed. And I think, I think your point is very, very true, which is that the failure in of itself is actually not that bad. Like no one friggin' cares if you fail or not, right? Like, I think what I realized was like my failures or embarrassments of a year ago, three years ago, five years ago, like the embarrassing thing probably lost like a middle school, like student council election. Yeah, it's a little bit cringe, but like <laughs> anyone actually care? Like the only person that cares more about that is yourself. And I think just realizing that actually no one cares and you can just reorient and recreate that narrative and pursue uh, any arbitrary goal that you want, I think is very empowering. So having that, I think early sense of failure, I think it's very, very powerful. Once you realize that failure is not that big of a deal. Yeah, and it's also not durable, which is the other interesting thing most people don't realize is like, if you work hard, you're aggressive, you keep going after what you want, like you'll learn from each failure until you succeed. So it's it's very difficult, like actually difficult to fail your entire life. And with each failure, the chances of future success increases. And so, you know, we talked about this last time, people don't mention it much, but most entrepreneurs fail the first few times and it's in the learning that they create something special. And so, you know, you asked about my, my path and it, it was very similar to what you had mentioned. Like my parents were really wanted me to be successful, to be safe. So my mom was from an Eastern European family and, and very much put into me, like, you need to work hard. You need to be successful. You need to make money. And that way you can find like freedom and safety. And so as a child, I internalized that as like, I'm not good unless I'm successful. And so, you know, grade two hands up in the class. I know the answer. I want to be the smartest kid in the class. I want to go to the best university and mostly because like I wanted to make money. And so I, I, I saw and I thought, hey, if I have money, I can buy these nice things. People are going to like me. I'm going to be credible. So I, I went to business school. In business school, I learned about investment banking and didn't really know what it was. I thought it's, you know, you may heard I banking and I thought it was internet banking. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's what, you know, that's what kids do. Like, that's what I got to do. That's yeah, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan sounds cool, and, right? It sounds prestigious. It's like, all right, yeah, my friends. Yeah, my friends like were doing that and my I wanted my friends, you know, I wanted to feel like I was I was smart. And so I went into to banking and and loved getting paid, but absolutely hated the job. And this whole time, like through you know, middle school, high school, I never really asked, thought like, hey, who am I and what do I really want? It was all things I had gotten from others. And so, you know, my actually personality's changed quite a bit of of what I perceive my skills to be, which we can talk about later, which has been pretty interesting on my personal journey. But so I started in finance, uh, worked at an investment bank and then a hedge fund. During the credit crisis, the hedge fund I worked for collapsed when, when Lehman Brothers went down, which was like, you know, at the time felt terrible. I came in one day, was performing well and just like, hey, you don't have a job and, you know, getting another job in like 2008 or nine was tough. And so I kind of got forced out of that field. And like you said, I looked at it and was like, ah, this is just... Like the hours are bad. Like, what am I, what am I doing? This isn't that exciting. And I looked at startups and I, I kept, you know, had that never happened, maybe none of this stuff would have happened. Like it, it's the more time you spend in finance, the harder it is to leave because the bonuses get bigger, the carry gets bigger and you have to give up more. And then when you're starting from scratch in a new industry, like the salary is not good. There's a lot of risk. You don't really have any other skills that, you know, it's, it's very hard to make the jump. So I was probably super lucky that that happened to me looking back. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to build a startup. Like, that's the thing, you know, that's how I'm going to make money fast. And like, I'm going to be the CEO and I'm going to build this crazy thing. And so I spent four years, raised funding and built a global telecom company. It was basically a SIM card that could provision uh, identities virtually. So, you know, you're American, you go to the UK, we could send you a Vodafone identity and you wouldn't pay roaming fees. And so it went well for a while. And again, though, it was like, didn't really care about the problem. The customer was just like, this is my chance to, to make something, to make money, to feel good, to like be successful. And, you know, we built that company to a hundred people. We built a super complex product, like software on the SIM card, the hardware itself, the backend billing system, the carrier interconnections. And I made a ton of mistakes. I, I was living in Toronto. This is in like 2010 when we started. So, you know, startups are relatively new. Y Combinator is new. There's not all this like tribal knowledge of, of, lean startup. And, and so I, you know, spent 
$25 million building out the system and it had to work in every phone and every country, you know, for business customers and personal customers, different distribution channels, which now I know is like, <laughs> like it was never going to work. Um, and, and during that process, like the gut wrenching feel of, of, as I mentioned, the last two years was like, okay, we're burning money. We don't have enough revenues. Roaming prices are coming down. Okay. We got to fire 25% of the staff, you know, three months go by fighting with the investors, trying to get a bridge loan, firing the next 25%. Okay. We can't afford the data center. We need to take the servers out of the data center, put them somewhere else and like default on that payment, like anything to survive. My friends had invested. My salary was like tied to the business. And so, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. I'd run out of money and, and we, you know, ended up the business failed. And so for two years, I was just nervous of like, where's my next paycheck going to come from? Is this going to, what happens if it fails? Like my parents are going to be so disappointed. My friends that invested are going to be sad. And it was just every day people yelling at me. I got personally sued. It was so intense, the feeling of like fear. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, like, finally, I was the last one, wrote it into the ground, shut down the business, and we lost the money. And, and you know, kind of after that, it was like, so what? Like, you took the big swing. You tried. You worked super hard, as hard as you could. You stayed with it till the end. You never acted, you know, without integrity. And at the time, it just felt, I felt like a complete failure. Like, I was living in my parents' basement. I, you know, was using substances to deal with the failure. And I just felt awful. And I felt like, Hey, I have no skills. Like, what am I going to do? I randomly like raised money, built teams, did sales, but I'm not really an expert in any of these things. And I'm like, I don't have any skills. And then that turned out to be completely false. And looking back on it now, I actually got experience doing everything, which set me up for, for what I do now. And so that transformation, that point sort of led me to the path through Israel and this Vipassana and then kind of the second part of my journey. Yeah. Let's talk through the, the abyss. So you at that point your way of dealing with it was sounds like what substance substances being stressed out i mean how are we I mean, it sounds like you weren't dealing with it that well i mean let's just describe paint the picture for us a little bit yeah so picture is like imagine someone who as i mentioned my entire identity was built around money and it was built around money and success to feel validation like i'm cool i'm successful i'm good girls like me i have nice things you know very very shallow and like not a lot of self-awareness there just just mapping a whole of like not a lot of self-love and confidence and so a feeling of okay everything i've been working for for 10 years including school is gone. All my friends are like, you know, comparison is another one we can talk about, which, which leads to a lot of sadness, um, Twitter specifically, but, you know, looking at my friends who are now senior bankers and senior consultants doing very well. And like, I can't afford to go out for dinner. And like, what does that feel like? And I'm, I'm at home and not even having the strength of like, okay, I'm going to go get a new job, but just thinking in my head, you know what, like you failed in finance, you failed in entrepreneurship. I'm not good. And I would just watch TV. I would honestly watch TV for like, a couple of months, like six hours a day in my parents' basement and just felt like, you know, I remember my mom just telling me, uh, oh, like there's jobs here. You should go be a real estate agent and like felt just like, oh my God, is that what I'm going to do next? And like, I just felt uh, really powerless uh, with like super bad habits. And so I started, yeah, that was like a pretty dark, dark time when you don't have confidence and you don't feel loved because everything, you know, I before that had a nice car, an apartment and kind of like lost all that, putting the money into the business. And so uh, a lot of the stuff that I felt made me successful was like taken away. And so this is sort of like this feeling of rock bottom of just waking up and like, you're like, how can I possibly change this outcome? You know, I'm like eight years into my career and this is what I have to show for it. So yeah, it really felt just like, how do I dig myself out? And I, you know, I had a girlfriend at the time I broke up with and it, that was really hard too. So it was just like all these things combining into, into like you're forging like steel to make a change, you know, like this life clearly wasn't working and it starts to be like, okay, well, why, why not? And that's when like the hurt pushes you to change or to like find change. And that started, you know, I can easily talk about these things of like, yeah, I just wanted to make money and I wanted social validation. And I didn't have self-love. Like those aren't things that people normally notice, right? Like they just act unconsciously. And so that kind of triggered like, hey, if you're not happy now, well, maybe you're not going about things in the right way. And that was the impetus to, to change. Yeah, no, I mean, it sounds like you're in a super dark spot. I mean, I, I don't want to go too morbid, but I think just a natural 
extension. I mean, was like, I mean, ending it all suicide on, on the mind. I mean, it sounds like, you know, being lost in substances was, would hopefully be an anesthetic to take the mind off the pain. And then what was the catalyst to, you know, start rounding this up? Yeah. And so the, the big thing, like, I, so I had ADHD and so I like really love stimulation. So I, I can like work really hard. I love, I get excited. I like, I love extreme sports and I, I love like, you know, alcohol and cocaine. And I, I would go out, try to be with friends and like turn off the pain. And, you know, the next day would feel like 50 times worse. And that's where you get into like, okay, I really need, like, I don't want to feel like this ever again. How can I make this stop? And so I've been reading, I've been meditating since high school, but like 10 minutes a day kind of thing. And I've been reading uh, Tim Ferriss and I just got some like, it's going to sound kind of silly, but you know, from the four hour work week, I got a lot of motivation that just, Hey, you know, I should have a, like a really good morning routine. And so I started really simple, which is like 10 minutes journaling. I read his book, the four hour body. And like, I, I'd always actually exercised also. And so I like made exercise more point in my life. And then I decided I'm going to just completely change my life and do something like, you know, kind of this like <clears throat> idea of pushing myself. And so I moved to Israel to be away from like all my group of friends to kind of just restart and like completely change my, my state. And so like, I'm not Jewish. I don't speak Hebrew. I went there completely alone, ended up working there and then doing the Vipassana there. And it was like a really, really crazy experience to kind of, again, like find a way to, to grow and, and change. And, you know, I never would have done that if that business hadn't failed you know probably would have been happy with my lifestyle and financial situation and would have been on the same same path chasing those same needs over and over versus like okay well what's causing these needs yeah i think there's always that head-on like adaptation you're just kind of always on that flywheel yeah so i think it's just it just i think a helpful analogy or template right where it wasn't like this crazy struck by enlightenment moment it sounded like you just I had one arbitrary day. I was like, hey, I, I'm going to just start a 10 minute meditation practice. I'm going to just start working out a little bit more. So out of this dark hole, it essentially, it sounds like a very depressive depression state. You just start building one tiny block at a time. And that gave you momentum to start making moves and, you know, got you to Israel and, and starting that, that new path. Yeah. And this is like, you know, if you're thinking about it, listening and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm stuck. Like it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I think you got to find like what is going to improve my day that is going to get me excited. And for me, it was like a really good morning routine. And that was kind of like an anchor. And then, you know, moved to Israel, started a new job, got excited about that. That seemed to be going pretty well. Then I did the meditation retreat. At the meditation retreat, I learned about psychedelic medicines. And all throughout this, like the starting of these good habits, I knew like I should quit drinking. Like all of my problems sort of like stem from from drugs and alcohol in terms of like just feeling sad, you know? And like I would feel so good and then that would kind of come in. And so I, I'd learned about psychedelic medicines at the, the Vipassana retreat. And, you know, shortly after, maybe about like six months later, I'd flown to Peru and like had done some research on ayahuasca and went with a friend uh, in like took like a little kayak into the jungle. We did four ayahuasca experiences. And in that experience, all kinds of stuff started coming up. You know, like where did this lack of self-love come from? Times I was bullied as a kid. The first time I ever smoked a cigarette to try to be cool and like get attention, you know, when I was 14 and it's like, okay, I'm like 30 now. Do I need to be like, why am I doing this still? And so learned a lot through that. And so it's a combination of like the little changes and then these big nuggets. And then, you know, we're now probably a year and a half from like the darkest point. I'm starting to feel really good. And after that ayahuasca experience, I actually never drank again. So I'm like close to six years sober now. And I just felt great. And like, because I felt great, good things, I'm not going to say like synchronicities, but like good things started to happen. You know, I ended up one of my best friends that was running Polychain, which is a giant crypto hedge fund. And he's like, hey, man, you have tons of hardware experience building teams. You want to come and like, advise our company. So I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And so, you know, moved to San Francisco, started advising a bunch of crypto companies, got like super into the Ethereum Foundation, joined the Ethereum Foundation. And all of a sudden, like all these people are working for me. Like it's it's going amazing. Everything we're doing is exploding. Financially, things are going well. My yeah, team like Ethereum's respects me. I have all these right goods. Now, if people are interested in tracking crypto, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And so that to me, like just kind of right place, right time. But like, 
it marked a huge transition and like, okay, now I'm operating from a place where like my habits are good. I'm healthy. I feel really good about myself. I feel like inspired. And then I'm starting to make decisions instead of, oh, I want to make money to like, wow, I want to be around good people. And like the people in the Ethereum ecosystem are like the best, you know? And at the time, this was in 2000, early 2017, late 2016. And, you know, nobody cares about prices. Like the you know, Ethereum sub $10, it's like, hardcore researchers, hardcore idealists about around decentralization. It was like the smartest PhD people I'd ever met. And like people are weird, like you'd get together and it was just like these really cool, fun, like hangouts talking about arts and like regenerative AIs on the blockchain, creating arts and just, just cool stuff like that. And so I was like, whoa, there's, this seems really interesting and fun. And these people care so much and they're so smart. And so I think when I felt better, about myself, there was less like, okay, I need, I'm grasping to make money and more like, what do I want to do? What kind of people do I want to be around? And that then led into like a whole adventure. And so my life really turned around and, you know, from complete rock bottom to like fucking amazing in, in like two years. And then my fiance, who I had met at the time was like, just incredible, incredible supporter. So kind. She moved me to San Francisco and Berlin. Like she's the absolute best kind of like, she's also really into the health stuff. So she introduced me to like breath work and saunas and ice baths. And then that kind of started a whole new path. But yeah, I think when you feel good about yourself and you kind of process these emotions and you put in place a daily habit, you start to feel better. And when you do like good things, good things happen, it seems. Yeah. I mean, it's a crazy, I think I think you gain a lot of wisdom, right? It sounds like you just have a lot of life experience in such a short time. And it's always interesting to talk to folks that have a density of life experience, right? Because you've like literally seen the darkest of abysses and just been on some wild rides where, yeah, it, again, like it's hard to avoid some of the crypto news, especially if you're on social media, right? Like, I, you know, Doge is pumping and crashing and ETH all time high and everyone's super excited about this new financial system and who knows how this all rides out but clearly you know being part of like the founding early members of that community that team i mean clearly helping create a, a new financial system that we're all a, a, hopefully a part of in, in the near future but before talking more about like i i want to i want to focus on just the the, the self-exploration were you always kind of risk on i mean i think i feel like an analogous spirit here where there's always like a, a an appetite to just sense new experiences, right? And I think whether that's through meditation. So I, I think, you know, I, I have been, it's been on my bucket list to do a Vispasana, you know, multi-day silent retreat. Because I think it's, uh, it just seems very novel, right? Like one, have I not been spoke, been speaking or been spoken to for multiple days in a row, especially in this modern context where we are almost, automatically just by default ADHD because we have notifications on on our on our mobile phones. So that that kind of completely polar experience seems very interesting to kind of tap into. I think using exogenous substances to tap into new psychological experiences or psychedelic experiences I think is very interesting, especially as you look at indigenous cultures and realize that almost you know, a number of cultures have had psych, you know, psychedelics or some sort of ceremony as a rites of passage or, or some way to tap into a broader maturity or adulthood, right? Ranging from more like the, you know, indigenous Native American tribes all the way to, you know, Brian Murray immortality key, you know, was, you know, the, the Greek aesthetics and philosophers inspired by psychedelics where the Roman philosophers and Stoics like Marcus Aurelius, in, inspired by the Lucian kind of psychedelic rituals, did Paleo Christianity stem from some of that stuff as well. So I think it's interesting to, to explore like what that all means in, in the modern context when I think some of these substances are becoming more accessible. I mean, that just opens up a can of worms of anthropology, history, philosophy, and also just a personal question. I mean, why were you risk on? Was it because like you were such a low, you know, kind of a down position? There was no danger to kind of risk on on some of these experiences, or was it through like each incremental step as you went into meditation that like opened up your mind a little bit to look at psychedelics, and then 
you incrementally increase your risk tolerance on some of the some of these activities. Yeah, so I think I had a risk tolerance just from some of the positions I would get in with with alcohol and, and drug use, and so like they kind of blunt the prefrontal cortex, the <laughs> logical decision making, and so you end up in situations that are like insane, you know, insanely dangerous. Like I built a house for Habitat for Humanity uh, in Ethiopia, and like one night ended up in a local village with a local drug dealer at a party alone with a bunch of people with guns doing drugs and like ins insanely dangerous, uh, only white person there just not caring, you know? And so, so, th so that, that there's definitely was some experiences in the past related to substances. But the, the funny thing is you mentioned risk on, and none of those activities are actually risk on if you do the research. So there's never been a case of like psychedelic medicines of, of overdose related. They're, these things have like been proven safe by the FDA. MDMA is likely to be legal for therapy next year. Ketamine's already designated as like FDA breakthrough medicine. Uh, psilocybin has been around since like literally the beginning of time. There's people that have done like 50 gram doses. So the, the psychedelic medicines themselves are actually very low risk. Like there's more danger in smoking a cigarette or getting in your car than taking uh, psychedelics, same, same with ayahuasca. So it's one of those things where it sounds scary because what you've been made to believe is that it's illegal. And same with the 10-day Vipassana, oh, I could never do that, it's so challenging. But the reality is, yeah, you can. And, and what I would push back on is like, what is more risk on? Like doing these things to figure out early in life what's important to you, get in touch with your feelings, get in touch with, be like, who am I letting go of things? Or to wait until you're 60, do the same thing, and then look back on your life full of regret. And so I think the risk to not doing these things is actually massive. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think that's why I've been just very interested in learning more about different ancestral practices around some of these, you know, traditions, molecules, cultural templates, right? Because, again, I think there's something to learn from history. And while you know, just because ancestor did it doesn't mean that it's right. But I think it's an interesting clue in terms of what behavior survived evolution and what was potentially adaptively like beneficial. And I, you know, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is that in modern Western civilization, there's not really a rite of passage anymore, right? I think a lot of us would describe, hey, maybe that's college, but college is a joke, right? College is, education is not very rigorous and a lot of it's partying. And there's not really a challenge, right? Like for most colleges, because you're paying them 40, 50 K a year, their job is to give you the stamp. Like they're not going to fail like a customer that has a 200 K uh, lifetime value plus donations down the line. So I think the incentives are all messed up in terms of like actually creating a rite of passage and a, an accomplishment. So I think when I look at, you know, what tribes that like really, really inflected and became successful, there always seems to be some sort of challenge that the society puts their, their young people through. And I think one of the things that I diagnose as a potential problem is that there's no challenge or no universal bonding identity that relates people of a culture, right? And I think, especially in America, there's just definitions of what being a quote unquote American even means, right? Like some Americans think America is even just bad, right? Like we think America is just founded on evil. And uh, again, like I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not here to proclaim that I have the right answer, but I think there are just like very interesting cultural patterns that have seemed to survive the test of time that we've forgotten for the sake of secularism or just like, hey, let's just. We're, we're not really thinking about it. Let's just like kind of make money, uh, as you said. Yeah, I think there's like one, as you mentioned, it's not just ancestral patterns. It's, it's like legitimate science. And so there's fantastic science detailing the effect of psilocybin on depression. It is like literally the best substance you can take for depression. The effect of ketamine on depression, OCD, uh, the effect of MDMA on PTSD, like these things perform orders of magnitude better than traditional medical, like what we'd call drugs. And not only that, they're safer on the body and they're not required to be taken every day. And so there's like a ton of evidence. I actually think it's going to be super common in the next 10 years to be doing couples therapy with MDMA, like for most couples and for to have a rite of passage using like a large psilocybin dose for, for many, many people. 
just because the value is so strong. And then the other interesting point is like, you know, I think the problem now is people are so overstimulated. And so we didn't have 400 emails, newsletters, Slack notifications, TikTok, Instagram, and, and that stuff hijacks our, our dopamine and rewards pathways. So if you're watching a movie and you're also looking at Twitter, like 20 years ago, there was natural boredom and natural boredom, you know, you're driving home from work, listening to the radio, you're going for a walk, like, you, you, you know, on the weekend, you didn't even have a phone. It was like a house phone. So you go out, there's no phones. Like that's the, for since the beginning of time, that's how we lived. And we're so overwhelmed, which then damages our breathing patterns, which makes it more difficult to absorb oxygen, which increases anxiety. And so I think that the, the, these rite of passages or like emotional state changes are now so necessary just because we're like, like you need to go nuclear to deal with like the nuclear inputs. And so I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty certain in 10 years from now, everybody will have these practices just because it's so difficult to deal with the overwhelming stimulation we have. Like they're, they're doing studies now and seeing like people who use their phone, especially Gen Z, like five hours or more, 70% are identifying as lonely. That's, that's insane. And there, there's studies showing that like loneliness has a similar impact on your health to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, increased inflammation, increased stress. Like that is insane. And so these things are, these things are also just happening. Like no one's told us, Hey, like using your phone all the time is bad for you. Right? Like you don't know that. And so to me, we started focusing in on, okay, well, psychedelics are illegal now. And like a Vipassana meditation, meditation is so difficult. What are ways we can help people reduce stimulation, like feel better, feel more into their bodies, improve their breathing because it's tough. It's tough out there. The common theme for my friends that are 30 to 40 with a child and have financial strain is like, I'm fucking overwhelmed. I don't feel good. You know, I feel scared. I feel nervous. I'm thinking all the time. I am stressed. I'm tired. And I bet you if you're listening to this now and you're like, that's probably you. And that's, that's like everyone. And so you know, most of these people, they know about exercise, healthy diet, but then you're like, well, what are your mental health practices? Like, what are you talking about? You know, I tried meditation and it didn't work and I, I felt bad about myself. Well, that's, that's not a good answer. No, I, I think you're spot on. And I think I would have been more skeptical, you know, in my early twenties, right? It's like, oh, that's, it sounds overinflated. It sounds kind of like a little bit woo woo or, you know, too, 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 like dependent on like this naturalism fallacy. But I think as I've grown and experienced a little bit more, I, it, it'll be interesting to see how history, and again, I, I, I am in line with your uh, prediction that I think we'll look at the current consumption of information as toxic, right? Because I just, like, I think just through the pandemic, I've just also just noticed that my phone use exponentially increased. I'm like addicted to that phone. And again, if you look at brain scans, like literally like a cocaine hit to your brain and no one has told us, hey, this is bad for you, but I have to actively like combat being entertained every single second of my day, right? I, I, like you just, I, you just, again, I just challenge the audience to walk around uh, Target or your the, like the Chipotle line. Everyone's just staring at their phone, just getting dopamine drips to get like random stimulation. And Maybe that's fine. Maybe maybe it is fine. Maybe we're just overly you know paranoid here, but it's probably not, right? Because again, to your point, like some of the most refreshing moments in, in in your memory have been when I'm like camping or hiking, and I just literally cannot. I'm forced to like de detox from uh, connectivity, and yeah, it's painful. It's literally like getting off a drug for the first few days. Like it is actually quite painful, right? Like just imagine, like t just challenging. Hey, I'm not going to turn on my phone for next week. You're not going to do it. I mean, it's like very challenging. Yeah, this would be interesting. <laughs> you know, if you're listening, you're like, oh, what are these guys talking about? I don't have any issues. And, and, you know, for me, I have a lot of healthy habits and I still like during COVID, a lot of those habits fell. Like I stopped going to the gym. I started a second business. We were online all the time, many Zooms. I started looking at Twitter all the time, looking for like real time news. And I found myself... It's the same feeling as when I would do cocaine, like exact same. And so like from someone who's done both, this is what it feels like. This is the, where the urge, that urge feeling. And so it's like, you know, you're watching a movie and the movie's not exciting enough. So you're pulling up Twitter and kind of like chatting with friends at the same time. You're out for dinner and maybe not during COVID, but you're out for dinner, you know, and, and there's a lull in the conversation. You pick up your phone, start looking at it. And so these are, these are dopamine hits. And so you're actually rewiring 
your dopamine pathways in response. And the more you flood with dopamine, so like your normal hang with friends, six people at night for dinner, let's say with no phones, gets replaced with like, I'm in seven Slack channels. I can now have like 30 conversations at once with no break. What happens, you're overwhelming the, the dopamine response in the brain. And as a result, just like with drugs, you start to change that wiring so you can no longer be happy doing normal things. You need to do drugs more and more often. It's the same with your phone. And so what happens, and I'm a victim of this, and like I went on a dark retreat recently to reset the pathways, but like, which is pretty aggressive and not like necessarily recommended. But, you know, what was happening is like, the just going for a walk. It wasn't fun because I would go for a walk and just be thinking about work or like, oh my God, I got to do this. You know, I just couldn't shut off. And everything sort of conspires, you know, when that's happening, you can't shut off. You're always in fight or flight. It makes it harder to sleep makes it harder to relax, makes it harder to eat properly and have willpower. Everything just kind of goes because your body's meant to be in a parasympathetic or like rest and digest nervous system state most of the day. And now we're like always on. So just from a physiological standpoint, like it's not even debatable of is this bad? It's like, yeah, it's definitely bad. And it's ruining your ability to be happy in the normal moments. And like, that's, it's, you know, it's researched. There's like a ton of feedback on what's happening. I mean, what, what if there's a devil's advocate, right? Like, I think there are some like techno, like maximalists who are like, it's it, like human society, human culture keeps evolving. We're going to just adapt to having 17 parallel conversations. We're going to have digital avatars running around in metaverses, like all, all this crazy stuff where it's like, actually it's, it's okay. Like we're going to just always be, we're, we're going to just live like, full connective lives why is that such a bad thing we're going to just be way more productive what wh how would you counter that argument yeah just that's just not how the brain works and so you know being stimulated all the time means your fight or flight nervous systems engaged and and doing that it means you can't relax and so you're just not going to be able to enjoy your your regular life and so i would you know anyone i know and i'm a per person who is yeah i've been addicted to technology overused it overworked and like i know when i'm happiest it's when i shut off and relax and exercise and spend time with friends like it's just so obvious what actually brings happiness and so you know huge challenge out there if you're somebody that believes that like you're going to be living in the metaverse checking email all the time just drinking coffee all day long like i would really like you don't see that in, in the, you know, you mentioned ancestral practices, but like in the blue zones, that's not a thing. You know, people like eat dinner together every night, they guard it and they spend time outside. They have healthy diets. Like there's no such thing as like, I'm telling you like eight of the 10 com most common cancers happen from not enough blood flow to the organs, which is a result of improper breathing, fight or flight all the time. And so I just, I really having a lot of knowledge of the physiology, doing breathwork training, like really reading a lot of this stuff, it doesn't, it just doesn't feel like that's a, that's a way to health and happiness. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I think you're right just in terms of just observing in terms of where I find creativity or finding time where I can actually digest a day, right? There's like the parasympathetic, hey, task orientation, right? Execution of tasks versus like consolidation and reflection and actually learning. And I think, that kind of like calm time or break time where there is gaps between execution does seem to be a very important part of creativity and innovation. Like you just need that consolidation time where your brain isn't just firing on execution threads. So even from like, uh, you know, someone who's like thinking about, hey, maximal efficiency, maybe I can just be on stimulants and just, I'm going to just outpace you. I think that, I, I mean, I think ultimately, I think whatever works wins like that is kind of I, I, I believe in kind of markets or capitalism. It just like if something is like suboptimal for a human, but still beats every other type of form, that kind of tactic kind of just generally will net out win because it because that cap that competition forces everyone to adopt that behavior. And I think I, I guess like that will be the experiment to run is will people with that kind of uh, this this other model of having you know, on times and then focus dedicated off times to reconsolidate, rebuild, rejuvenate, think, be creative, which one wins? I mean, I, I don't have, you know, just personally, I don't have like a dogmatic answer. I think the model of recovery, again, from an ancestral consistency perspective and my personal experience seems to be the right path, but I wouldn't, I would not, you know, be so bold to say that like, hey, maybe someone out there can like just 
Rick and crush us all by being like a, 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 a hopped up 24 seven and maybe burn out in 30 years. But in those 30 years, they're bright. I totally. But, uh, but again, it's like, what do you want in your life? Is it like max productivity and as measured by like success at a company? Because yeah, that's possible. And maybe drinking coffee every day and just working as hard as you can is, is the, is the outcome. But a lot of people don't realize when they're like, oh man, I would love to be Elon Musk. Like you have to give things up to, to be that person, right? Like you don't take on the success and the creativity and the fame. You take on, you know, the workaholic. I'm not saying this is him, but you just, you have to take on everything, which might be like working 24 seven and not being super happy. And so what I know for a fact, and I'm not saying that, Hey, taking rest is like, I believe that, but you know, I'm not saying taking rest is going to allow you to produce the most, especially in a short period of time. But I'm, I'm just saying for like personal happiness, I've noticed when I work too hard, I become like judgmental. I become impatient. It starts to be like, why isn't everyone else working this hard? How can we, we're not pushing faster. I get like kind of angry and I notice it. I notice it. And then I'm also like really good at tasks. Like you said, I'll get up, you know, at 6 a.m. I'll crush like a thousand emails. And like, then it comes time to write something that requires like some deep reflection about strategy or a legal document or a challenging, you know, uh, business partnership, a negotiation. It's like, oh, all of a sudden I'm pushing that off five days because I'm in task execution mode, you know? And so it's like, I find when I have time to shut off the creativity, like the ability to explain the vision, the strategy, all that stuff improves. And then it's also like, if you're working on something you love, what is the rush? Like personally, my two businesses, I'm so obsessed with them. It's like my life mission. I want to work on these forever. So I don't need to burn out and like, you know, open so fast in the next six months and crush it. It's just kind of like slow and steady and you'll, you'll gain mastery slow and steady with like a good pace over time. So I think the biggest lever you have is like, how much time do you want to spend on something? Cause you love it versus like that was in my early career. I bounced around, you know, I mentioned finance and then, you know, uh, hardware. And then it was like Ethereum and even at Ethereum, it was going so well, but I actually loved wellness and helping people. And so now I've picked something not because of the smart people and not because of the money, but because like I care about the customer and I want to deliver this service. And that means I could work on this forever. Like it's never going to get boring. Uh, and so then I don't need to, you know, build this career in four years. And so I found that, and even in this, I do, you know, I want to build something awesome. So I get succumbed into working too much. And that's why I did the dark retreat. But I would, uh, yeah, I would just say like, you know, I think you got to think about what you, how do you want to feel day to day? And I know from, and I worked with the hardest workers, you know, same as you, crypto, Stanford, like these people a lot. And like, they always burn out <laughs> when you go that hard with coffee and you work 16 hours a day, like every single time. Yeah. And I think the, the most intimidating competition is when people are just having fun. Right. When people are willing to do this for free, oh man, good luck competing with them. Right. Cause it's like, yo, like I don't, I can eat your margin. I can, I'm, I'm having fun eating glass. You're like stressing out and I'm just having a blast here. That, that, those are the scariest people to compete with. Yeah. Like we literally on Friday nights, we'll create, we'll DJ, create sets and make breathworks to them. And that's like fun. And like our team will sit here, we'll do the breathwork together to hang out instead of like a bottle of wine. And it's so fun thinking about like the music, the arc, the breathwork exercise, the meditation at the end, we test it on each other. We laugh, we love it. And like, that's what I do for fun. You know, I go out and I go in the sauna and I create like a class in the sauna. That's amazing. That's going to help people have an emotional experience. And like, I do it for free. I don't even care. It's just so awesome. And so, yeah, to your point, it's like, that's what you have to find, you know, that from all my exploration, it's like, what is going to make you, you happy? I think is really like a good, a good target. Yeah. So let, let's talk about that. So all these experiences culminate into you founding Inward. But before talking about Inward, I want to just do a quick survey on the silent retreat, uh, the ayahuasca plant medicine, and then this dark retreat. To me, they're all somewhat related in terms of just like manipulations of or, or, or detractions away from exogenous distraction or just like resetting like new, new, like new, new stimulus to like kind of reset your brain. So I think in some sense, I think when people reach quote unquote enlightenment through dedicated training of meditation, I think when people talk about being in a flow state, whether they're in competition or they're in combat or they're like coding really well. I think potentially in some psychedelic states, I feel like they're all very similar states, whether that's flow, like Zen enlightenment, 
or being in a very like peak psychedelic experience. They seem quite related to me. Curious to get your analysis and breakdown between some of these more impactful experiences, whether that's silent, dark, you know, ayahuasca, other psychedelics. How would you reconcile and, and build a little bit of a framework here to think about all of these things? Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. So I would say the first of the three in my mind is, is to attempt would be the 10 day meditation retreat. And what I, the way I would think about that is like, you're doing 10 minutes on headspace per day, let's say for you to feel what it feels like to meditate, it's going to take quite a while. And we talked about this last time, but think of meditation, like a skill, you know, like playing the guitar or playing a sport, like you don't pick up a guitar and play a song. It can take months, right? And so meditation is that same way and it depends on how much time you spend. And so it can be very tough if you're doing 10 minutes a day to do 90 days and you're kind of like, ah, I don't, I don't really know if I'm feeling anything, if this is valuable. I, I have friends who meditate 300 times a year and are still like, uh, you know, I don't know. And so the best thing about the meditation retreat, even though it seems hard, is you're doing 100 hours of meditation, right? So it's 600 10 minute sessions. That's like two years of, of calmer headspace in one 10 day period. So like if you're thinking about learning your skill, mastering your craft, the best thing about that 10 days is afterwards, you know what it feels like. And this doesn't stay with you, but you, you get to a state where you're like, wow, I know what it feels like to be aware. I understand my thoughts that they come up and I don't control them. I understand emotions come up and I don't control them. Oh, I can actually watch these and know what's happening and they're not me. And you like experientially feel that. And when you do, you sort of have a guidepost of where you're going for the rest of your meditation career, let's call it. And so, you know, like, okay, fine. You fall off for a bit, but in 10 minutes, you know, like, okay, I've been to that space before. There's value, a lot of value in that space. I felt it. It's amazing. And so the best thing you can literally do is start with the 10 day because every other meditation after that, you know, you think you're playing basketball or kite surfing, you're learning this thing when you're, you're actually kite surfing and you know what you're doing in a session, you're kiting the entire two hours. So you're mastering, you know, the turns, the board, when you first start, you might be kiting 35 seconds, the rest of the time you're swimming and crashing the kite, trying to find the board. And so think of it that way, as you do this hundred hours, you know, where you're going, every meditation after is more effective. And then I also find it helps you uh, with the ability to stabilize. So it really helps prepare you for these challenging psychedelic medicine ceremonies and, and something like the dark retreat. So that's, that's the meditation. I would highly recommend it. If you're thinking about it, like the best way, there's always a wait list. It's dhamma.org. Put your name down like nine months from now, you know, just like, okay, I may or may not go. I'm going to put my name down. And as it comes closer, maybe you start moving around your schedule a little bit. And then it's kind of like, Oh, I'm going to go. And you know that you don't have to pay up front. There's always a waiting list. So if people can't, if you want to cancel last minute, fine, you know, but just if you don't put it on the schedule, it's never going to, it's always going to be like, I don't have 10 days because 10 days with no phone. And like, it's pretty, it's an intense experience. It's 10 hours of meditation per day. But everyone I know who's done it after is like, wow, that like life-changing thing. So that's, that's the meditation, the psychedelic medicines. It's like, you don't really have a choice. You take them and you're, you're sort of, you're on the journey. And what I find they do really well is help. So what they're doing physically, they're shutting down the default mode network of the brain. And, and so your brain has a prefrontal cortex, which creates your identity. So, you know, all your concepts like a light or what, you know, I'm a, I'm a male and this age, I'm the funny guy, or I'm shy, or I'm a Republican, I'm American, like I'm a Cubs fan. All these things are constructs you, you make up. And our brain thinks in stories to survive. It's like a computer in that way. Like we know what an animal is. We know what a work day is. And over time, you just have these programs that run that create our identity. And so that part of our brain is very useful for survival reasoning. But using psychedelic medicines, it shuts down. So as a result, your brain can start making new neural pathways, new connections. And then in that state, you oftentimes process stored traumas and emotions that are in the body. And so the idea is that when you're young, some girl made fun of you when you went to give a speech, you lost your, your high school or, or student council or middle school election. There's some failure there. And if you felt it at the time, you felt that emotion, it was very hard to process because it hurt so much. It's stored in the body, in the cells. And there, there's this idea called the somatic completion theory. That's the thing of it, like your shoulders are tense and you like let them go. And so there's everything that's ever happened to you is stored deep in your body. And again, a ton of research around this. It's like 
a theory that's like 50 years old uh, from this guy, Peter Levine, if you want to live more uh, amazing stuff. And so the idea is that the psychedelic medicines help put you in a state to release traumas and emotions. And so for me, it was like getting bullied as a kid, crazy memories come up and you kind of process them and let them go. And so you think you're carrying this weight of like, I was rejected. I'm a failure deep, deep in like your six year old core and, and you let those go. And so I found extremely powerful for resetting the nervous system, letting go of old trauma, and then improving the, the neural pathway change and growth. And so, and this is actually proven through ketamine use and, and testing, but the ability to make change, behavioral change. And so whenever I use psychedelic medicines with an intention, like that, the month after I'm like on fire, I'm ready. You know, I, I use them to, as I said, quit drugs, quit alcohol, quit smoking, Anytime that I feel like I'm getting too overwhelmed, I know that's there as a, you know, even a small amount with like a psychotherapist and an intention, it's super powerful for behavior change. So that's kind of like the big guns that you use every once in a while where the meditation is the daily practice. And it could be meditation, it could be breath work, it could be, you know, walking. Yeah. And I just want to say that like, like I'm, I'm hunched up with you. I'm excited about the therapeutic applications here. I'm actually looking at, you know, potential investments and to support the whole movement. But uh, like, where should we be careful of? Because I think we've also heard of stories of bad trips. People can really get psychological breaks. You know, you're probably not going to get, you know, the full therapeutic benefit if you're taking mushrooms at a rave, for example, right? Like, where can we go astray with these powerful medicines, right? Like, I think, I think, I think we need to be thoughtful in terms of, you know, or, or maybe just get your thoughts here. You know, what do you look for in terms of place? therapist, practitioner, what do you look for in terms of the right setting and context to, you know, to, to explore here? Yeah. And so I've worked with like probably thousand people in our community around this stuff, like helping them make decisions. And then personally, I've probably used psychedelic medicines a hundred times in six years, like something like that. And I don't really use them too much anymore. Like if I really need them, but, uh, I would say like, yeah, I'm telling you what the benefits are, but there's also like some things to be careful of, as you mentioned. So one, the first is like do an intake with a trained therapist. And so there are many therapists that offer ketamine. You can search for integration therapists. You can go to the MAPS website and do an intake. Uh, should you be taking this at all? If you're on any SSRIs or have any history of mental health, there's definitely some danger. So, uh, you know, first step is like, are you able to deal with the stress that this is going to put on you. And now if you feel mentally healthy, then, you know, I think there's a lot of value. Second issue I've seen is like people go on retreat. They don't work with a psychotherapist. They kind of just do it on their own. And yes, they still have beautiful mystical experiences, but when they come back, like there's time, your brain is more fertile. Think of it like a garden that's just been tilled. Like, what are you going to plant in it? And if you don't have community a strong therapist, I personally am like just a huge believer in, not 100% essential, but I would recommend it. And like there's people who get benefits without and practices, you know, like meditation and breath work and some of these things. And if you don't have those, the actual behavior change is, is unlikely. And so I've seen, you know, dozens of friends like, hey, man, I saw I saw your change. I'd love to go do a retreat. They go to a retreat. They come back. They're all pumped up for like a month. And then it sort of fades fades away as these things do. They're not like silver bullets. And so I'm actually pretty bearish in the regard that you can just take the medicine one time and it makes a long lasting change. I would say I've, I've seen that happen zero times. I think the combination of the medicine with like deep psychotherapy work, like actually thinking through, you know, okay, what is it I want in my life? What intentions do I have? What do I want to change? Why is that? Am I giving myself enough love? Do I have someone to talk to and be vulnerable with? Do I have someone to keep me accountable? Sort of led into what we wanted to build at Inward because I just, I had like really good results, mostly from meeting my fiance who introduced me to all these healthy patterns and then having her and these bathhouses to go to at night. And I just seen a lot of friends fail to implement behavior change and I've seen a lot of escapism. And so like every two weeks you're going back for that like LSD trip or mushroom trip. And it's like, oh, let's go. And like, you're really like, it's kind of an escape from your, your life. And so I would say, you know, I, I would hundred percent agree with you. I'm bearish on using these things on their own. I think also though, like they should be, you know, some people can't afford professional help. So in that case, there's like really good resources online, but definitely would say like, it's a full package thing you're committing to. And it's why I think the psychedelics plus meditation go hand in hand super well. Yep. Makes sense. hundred percent. And then let's touch upon your uh, dark retreat. 
essentially living in a cave. And, and how would you reconcile that with or, or compare contrast with the, the previous two? And the reason I did that was just, you know, I've been really interested in one of your guests, Cameron Seppo's concept of, of dopamine fasting. And I know it, it doesn't really mean what it, what it sounds like, but it's this idea that you can overwork your dopamine pathways from too much stimulation. And I, I just found it to be true. Like during COVID, you know, I have these practices and I was like, you know, back to back nine Zoom meetings, like not eating lunch, coffee, not working out because the gym was closed. Like, as I said, checking Twitter all the time, all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm investing more in crypto, which is kind of like gambling, like all these, you know, I'm ordering Uber Eats every night. I'm like, what am I doing? And it's just from, from so much stimulation, a lot of my patterns change, like less social time means more internet time. And I was like, fuck. And, and like, this is getting me like, I have an ice bath in my backyard. I meditate every day. I like, you know, I have the practices, I have the knowledge and I'm still like totally got sucked in. And, uh, it was just like, wow, I feel shitty. Like I feel unhappy. I feel stressed. I feel overwhelmed. Like what the hell? And I'm like building my dream. And it's just like, not enough time, not enough space. And that's why I say to you, like, you're like, oh, what do you think about the people who want to push it? Like I do, I pushed it. I pushed it like 16 hours every day. So I like, felt like shit. <laughs> And, uh, so I was like, okay, I need, I need to change the meditation retreats were generally closed for, for COVID. And so I'd heard about the dark retreat. It sounded pretty weird at first, the way it was explained to me. And that's always like a sign, like, okay, look more at this. And then it's also been a practice since like the beginning of time with, with Buddhism, like very advanced practice. So kind of saw that and was like, well, that sounds cool. And it also just sounded hard. It was like, okay, this sounds like really insane. Like I was pretty afraid of the dark. And so it was just like, man, like this seems next level. I'm curious as to what will happen. And it just seemed like based on all this discussion around dopamine fasting that like limiting stimulation completely would be really helpful as a reset. So I went out there and I, I wrote an article about it like in detail for people that are interested, but uh, you know, in the woods in Oregon, outside of Ashland, like no cell phone service, like complete, beautiful, untouched land, giant garden, 25 people lived on the land and in a cave and they would, bring you food once in the evening, put it through a cubby and the room was so dark. You couldn't see your hands in front of your face, like pure darkness, like never adapts, which we're, we're not really in, in society. And so when you're moving around, there's always this idea of like fear, like it's not fear, like, Hey, someone's going to grab me, but it's just subconsciously, you don't know what's happening in your surroundings. And so there's discomfort. So like you get up to go to the bathroom, you have to find the bathroom, you have to get on hands and knees. If you like take a wrong turn, you know, you're going to eat, you're like getting the containers, making sure which ones are full, which ones are empty. Oh man, where I'm going to leave them. Like I'm eating, is something going to grab me? It's just very, uh, you're, you're in this, this like nerve wracking space all the time. You know, you wake up, you open your eyes to see like I'm safe and, and it just looks the same. You close your eyes, it looks the same. So you can't escape. So sometimes it just felt like massive pressure and claustrophobia. I couldn't, I can't breathe after around five days, you can't even sleep. So you're just like in your own thought patterns with nothing else to stop them for 70 hours straight. And so there was a ton of intensity and just learning how, okay, when I'm stressed, you know, the, the trick they taught me was like, relax, 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 feel into your body, feel into your body, find a gap in your thinking and inject a thought and intention you want. So maybe it's bravery or strength and remember a time like, okay, this is what it felt when I like quit my job or when I asked my fiance to marry me or, you know, when I did the right thing, when it was hard and like, you feel that in your body and then it's like, whoa, I can actually change my state with my mind, with my thoughts, with my feelings. And so by doing that over and over and over every day, every time you felt nervous, you kind of learn this new skill. And so I found the dark was really interesting and like it drives you to think about mortality, uh, a lot about death. Like for me, everything slowed down. It was like you had mentioned tasks all the time. And that's when you're an operator, you know, you're just executing. And, and so the tasks change every day, obviously. And so it's just like this never ending rainfall, like five days into the dark retreat, it's like, boom, you put the umbrella up. You're not even thinking about tasks that's done. Thinking about like, what do I want out of life? Was my life meaningful? What happens when I die? I started thinking about what happens when my parents die. I was getting scared. We have limited time left. Like, is that a lonely journey? So it just opens up these spaces to be creative. How did time feel? Like, did, could you track? I mean, just through the meals, you could kind of track the days. But I mean, it must be exponentially 
harder, crazier than the silent retreat because like there's still visual stimuli. You'll still hear maybe a bird chirp or something, but this is like as little stimuli as possible. So everything just like bouncing around swimming in your brain. Yeah, I think they're different. So in the in the meditation retreat, you're doing guided meditation for 10 hours. And so you're really, it's very strict. You're following routine. There's like a lecture each evening that you kind of watch. And it feels like you you really go deep in meditation. The dark was hard because there's no, there's no teacher, there's no structure. You're just on your own. And like personally, my practice, like I came in as I said, at like 200 miles per hour, like I missed a flight connector on the way there because I was looking at my email and Twitter and I went to the wrong gate and just to show you like how, you know, the phone was crushing me. And I, uh, I was like, I wasn't ready and I could meditate six hours a day maybe. And then the rest was just thinking. And so it was really tough because it just never stops. And so there was more of this element of fear and like reset, which, which when you're just meditating, you're really focused on going deep meditating. And so I think they're, they're very different in that way. And, and from the dark retreat, I thought like, it's almost like this sense of a, a massive restriction. Like you have nothing to find joy in outside of there were moments of, of joy in the body. But like when you come out, like it felt like I could see every individual like electron, you know, and like things were vibrating. They were so sharp. And I was looking at the stars, each breath of air felt like I was drinking water, like fresh water in my lungs, like just like, you know, cold mountain air, like, oh my God. And then, you know, I start walking and I watch the sunrise and I'm seeing like the browns, I'm smelling the ground. I'm seeing like the first greens. Then you see the sun light up the sky a little bit blue. Then the sun ray hits my eyes and it's just like exploding with gratitude for the simplest things. And I think that level of restriction in the dark then makes everything you just realize like, wow, okay, well, taking a nice, healthy breath, being outside, I, I went in a cold creek, I just took my clothes off, went in the swim for a swim at like sunrise in this freezing cold creek, and then they had a sauna. And it was just like, wow, this is like, in these four hours since I've woken up, it's been like, a 100,000 times better than the last 10 days. And you realize like, wow, life is great. And so it built up this level of gratitude that just the other two didn't have. Yeah, I think it's almost like that foil, that foil mechanism, right? Like, literally lack of all stimuli and you realize that stimuli is just like a, is like magical like i'm, I'm like I, I can just kind of empathize or just at least kind of interpret that like it must be as like the the visual impact must be as crazy as any psychedelic experience just given how starved of visual stimulus you were would that be comparable just like in terms of just like impact or just beauty it's just yeah it's just moment moment of like absolute beauty and I, I think each of the three are all extremely powerful and they all kind of do different things and i i would like super highly recommend them all i would just say in order i mentioned because the dark retreat itself is like quite challenging when your mind isn't used to no stimulation like if you just went in there and you're you're up imagine for like 70 hours straight with nothing like it's helpful to have like the ability to go back to your breath, you know, to, to watch your thoughts, to understand where you are. And I think, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like self-induced torture, right? Cause I think uh, solitary confinement is essentially the most strict punishment for the felons and criminals in our society. So it's taking that level of solitary confinement and put amp it up with no, you know, even less stimulation. So in some sense, it's like literally you're torturing yourself. Yeah. And it, it like, yes, but also like, you know, it can end and you can leave at any time. And, and so it was hard, but it wasn't like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like this is, you know, which just was like, okay, this is a chance for me to, what am I doing here? You know, why, why do I, why did I even feel the need to, to do this? Like what's going to come? And, and you find these days like of pure flow state where no new stimulation, no new thoughts are coming in. Like, what do I want out of life? And I don't normally think on that level because I'm so busy, quote unquote, you know? And so it's nice to just have that time to like think differently. So it's a really beautiful opportunity, I think. Yeah, no, keep exploring, keep pushing the boundaries because I am I want to experiment and, and, and yeah, follow some of the paths that you explore. And maybe there's just other things we could potentially figure out to, to challenge ourselves on. So we'll have to, you know, continue the conversation on that front, but I do want to touch upon inward. So it sounds like all these culmination, these life experiences, being in finance, being an entrepreneur, 
standing up a new ecosystem with cryptocurrencies, with Ethereum and getting you know, involved early there, and then finding your passion with health, wellness, like self-understanding. Talk to us about Inward, how, how are you bring all these lessons together? How can people interact and interleave in this community? Yeah, so it's really um, a culmination of all these things you you mentioned, and it just started as a side project. And so, you know, my fiance introduced me to saunas and ice baths, and we would go to bathhouses all around the world. And in San Francisco, we'd go to Archimedes, we lived in Berlin. Every time there'd be a conference, we'd make a WhatsApp group, and like 30 people would go to the bathhouse. And we're like, wow, this is like, why is this so amazing? Like, you wake up the next day, it could be the dingiest bathhouse, and you're like, fuck, that was like such an awesome social time. And so it's like, okay, this is cool. I'm going to learn more about it. I did the Wim Hof training. I went to like a few of his events and was like, whoa, like, this is really cool. Like, I can't believe through breath work you can get to this space. And like, the cold for me, especially I've seen it for people who love stimulation, very, very effective for like, stopping the mind and it's tripling the amount of neuroepinephrine in the brain which is a neurotransmitter responsible for like mood attention vigilance so physiologically like within 30 seconds you're in a meditative state a state of flow any emotions just fade and i'm like wow this is so cool like this is the coolest thing so i got pretty obsessed with that and in my house while i was working for ethereum the water didn't go cold enough so i was like okay i'm gonna build one of these and so me and a couple friends built one in my backyard and every night we would host people just like for fun. You know, we would just like for the neighborhood come by and we started developing our own process around how to make it into a meditation. So, you know, how to focus on changing subconscious beliefs, how to find uh, your breathing to turn on the parasympathetic state, as I mentioned, how to react to stress. We would move in like sound bowls and essential oils. We would have couples ice baths where they do eye gazing and just kind of, kind of, you know, fucked around. And Throughout that summer, we built a community of a few hundred people and people just show up like in the day and, you know, like, oh, this is so awesome. I was like, this is really cool. And then they were like, well, we need to do something for the winter. So we built out my garage and kitted it with a sauna, ice bath, like designed it really nice, made it kind of feel like a, like a Soho house type vibe and put up a landing page for the neighborhood. And like, you know, no joke within a month, like 20, 30 people are coming every day. And then we realized like, okay, like at first I was doing it for longevity and health reasons. Like I follow Wim Hof, Rhonda Patrick, you know, David Sinclair, like hot and cold thermal activities are like legitimate after fasting, the best thing you can do for longevity for a number of reasons. But that was, I was like, well, this is like healthy. I want to do it. And then, you know, when we start doing it, people are like, oh, this is the best way into meditation. It's like, you know, lawyer, 40 years old, no care about spirituality, no mental health practice, never meditated gets in the ice bath and like not thinking about their phone. Like, whoa, that's super powerful. So then we're like, okay, it's a meditation practice. And so we build this space and the space is like, you come in like, wow, cedar essential oil in the air smells great. Feels cool. It's like, I'm in this cool, like tea room, like I'm at a solo house. And then people start making friends. So like, you know, two people would meet in the sauna and they'd go on a ski trip together. And we're like, what the hell is happening here? This is crazy. And so we start doing classes, you know, as I mentioned, like, two people in the ice bath doing an eye gaze until they're shivering, coming out and shaking and like doing a trauma release or like thinking about what you're afraid of in the sauna and complete darkness and sharing it and, and not being worried about what people are going to think because it's dark. So like using the hot and cold, like this feeling of being alive from the ice bath, right? Like you're conquering your fears, you're super present, you get out, you're all excited, you want to talk, no one has their phone, you go into the sauna, it's like the perfect social lubricant that kind of replaces alcohol. So that was going on and that was like amazing, so much fun, still a side project. And then during COVID, we had to shut down. And so the breath work we were doing, we started doing it online. And, you know, we had about a thousand customers. People were really nervous, scared, anxiety, like COVID was crazy in March 2020, like toilet paper runs, like just insanity, like people not leaving their houses. And so we start doing this breath work and like 20 people, then 40, then 100, then 200. Now people are like, hey, can you do one for anxiety? Could you do one for sleep? You know, could you do one for imposter syndrome? I'm struggling with my wife. Could you do one for that? Could you do one for relationships? And we find it just has this like super powered way of helping people that are struggling with emotions or just helping people feel energized. And so, you know, we're, we're putting these on YouTube, people are paying and then they're, they're like asking for recordings and more. And so we're like, okay, well, maybe we can, we can build something here. So my team has like, you know, musician, DJ, artists and so we spend 
a few months just internally scripting and recording the best breathwork content in the world and have, you know, now 200, 250 classes, very similar if you think about like calm or headspace, but for breath work. And so if you want to energize and boost your energy in the morning, if you want to like replace coffee in the afternoon, if you want to fall asleep, if you want to get into that parasympathetic state I mentioned and relax, if you want to deal with challenging emotions, specifically like if you're struggling with like a breakup or grief or a job loss or, you know, just something happened, someone was rude to you. Anytime your state is off, you can change it with a, with a breath work. And so we built out this platform and kind of looked around and saw, okay, there's you know, these amazing Wim Hof and XPT, but they're very uh, male, like resilience focused. And then there was like holotropic breathwork and a lot of these psychedelic style breathworks, tons, amazing, but also like very long and sort of geared towards people who are into spirituality. And we have people in the mainstream, you know, who struggle to meditate, who use calm four times, who don't really, haven't really got into like meditation, yoga, this kind of stuff. We're like, how do we build something for them that's like science backed? So everything that James Nestor, I read like every, you know, breathing research paper, James Nestor's book, did a whole bunch of trainings. And we're like, okay, we also found that like 90% of people mouth breathe, like their, their breathing patterns are impacted because they're not chewing enough and they're eating too much acidic forming foods. And as a result, we're not absorbing enough oxygen in the, in the brain and organs. And that's sort of the default. And so we're like, holy shit, not only is there this amazing thing that can help be more fun meditation and help those things, but also we can help your foundational breathing. And they're like, oh, that's really cool. And so the thought was like, let's put something together, all the breathwork styles in one place that's like very affordable. And let's also make it fun. So the difference in our platform is like, you know, the music, like we're working with like amazing DJs from Burning Man. So you're listening to it. And it's like, well, I'm at like a fitness class. I'm like, I'm feeling great. This is crazy. And then like, bam, hits you with an emotion and you're just like, whoa, you know, to the point where we have friends doing this stuff on like Friday and Saturday nights socially. So we build that and now we're seeing something that's like, I left Ethereum to, to do this, which was tough because as you said, it's like absolutely exploding. I loved it. I had a really good position, but I just felt like testimonials I'm getting, like a woman couldn't leave her house during COVID person with like a 10 year drug addiction, another person with a drug addiction, person who like struggled with feelings of like darkness and like self-worth, like letting that out. I'm just hearing this stuff like this is insane. And so I started to see this vision of many physical spaces where you go to that are inspiring and healthy. And this is like the first step. Like you go and you're doing the sauna and you go because it's cool. But then you see people there that are like, you're like, wow, these people are inspiring and I feel good. Then you take the mobile app and you use the breath work at home and it kind of helps you, you know, get through some of these emotions. It's kind of an easier way to get into meditation. And then we have a digital community. And so those three things kind of combine. And we're saying like, we're a healthy experiences company that's helping people to be healthy and happy and like doing it in a fun way. And so a lot of the stuff I've seen in like mental health meditation, it's very like prescriptive and like, hey, you have this problem, you know, here's this thing. And I really thought we're not targeting going the deepest, but we're just targeting like the average person wants to feel better and they want to do it in a fun way that's cool. And there just wasn't a mental health brand that was like, had that you know, coolness of like a Soho house or a fitness class or like something like that. And so we want to build this entire transformation engine where you meet your friends there. Everybody's like just trying to be happier and healthier, doing these hard experiences, but doing them together with like awesome music. And yeah, and then now just since we started doing that, we're opening our, our second space. And the second space is like a 40 person sauna with like crazy sound system for ice bath. It's got a fire pit because people have talked around fires since like the beginning of time. And so the idea is, you know, there'll be classes there to learn about breath work in the sauna. And then at night, like instead of going to a bar, you know, you want to come 10 to midnight, there's awesome music playing and you, you just kind of use these things in chat. And so my idea is to really make being healthy and happy, fun and cool. hundred percent. I'm so excited about your vision and the concept. I, I, I you know, when I've been thinking about this, like, what are happy hours? Why is everything social re revolving on ethanol, alcohol, like a, a neurotoxin? When, as you're saying here, some of these experiences you can get from temperature or breath work or, you know, chatting on a fire in a cool space that's like branded like a, a social context. 
I, I would argue, I think, is, is like just superior in terms of fun and learning and, and relationship building, right? So I want to be a part of a world that has more inward bars or, or, or meeting spaces than like alcohol bars, right? Like, why does it that we have to rely on, on, on this specific molecule or chemical when there might be better chemicals and or better just practices, right? Like, and I think that's where I think we can be innovative around culture. Like, you know, we have to wrap up here, but how do people like tune in and inward? And then two, I'd love to like, like I need to schedule time to actually come visit and, and, and do this experience and then continue the conversation. Yeah. So October 1st is the goal to open the flagship. We've started construction and designs are done. They're insane. I could probably link them. If you do show notes or something, I'll send you like some, some, you know, visuals of the space. It's just, it's mind blowing the aesthetic. And so our physical spaces are in Toronto. And like, yeah, I would love to host you. Could stay at my house, you know, come for a week. We'll take you through all these different like cold experiences, maybe some psychedelic medicine experiences could introduce you to some people. And then uh, for people to find us, yeah, we'd love, you know, we have an amazing breathwork platform I mentioned at uh, www.inwardbreathwork.com. And it's just the largest and I think highest quality breathwork content uh, in the world. And there's like structured programs. So again, like boosting energy, sleep, dealing with challenging emotions, improving foundational breathing patterns, all that stuff is there and available. Amazing. Hey guys, check out Robbie. Robbie's, I think you can, I think just through this conversation, just like a good authentic person, right? I think you can almost like just sense the vibe. So as always, pleasure to have this conversation and look forward to continuing the conversation and dialogue. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. 